This video will cover brain and neurons. This is lecture video 11. The learning objectives that we cover are shown here. They're basically divided into two parts. The first half of the video covers neurons and action potentials and neurotransmitters, and the second half covers the brain and brain regions. Uh, the first learning objective explain the general functions and organization of the nervous system. The nervous system is all about command and control of the body, and the brain is the ultimate controller. Uh, the brain uh, receives signals and sends signals through the spinal cord and spinal nerves, as well as cranial nerves. And then the brain makes decisions about things like what's my blood pressure, what's my temperature, and then adjusts and sends signals throughout the body to maintain homeostasis. So again, the brain and our spinal cord can send out uh, efferent signals to effectors like skeletal muscle, for example, as well as receive information from the body. Uh, we call those afferent signals. The afferent signals come from things like sensory receptors uh, regarding things like blood pressure or temperature or touch or the position of your muscles. So we get efferent and afferent signals going uh, either from our brain out to our body or to our brain and spinal cord. So again, afferent signals send information to the brain about things going on in the body, whether it's pain or blood pressure. The brain then has to analyze that information in order to do what's best for homeostasis, whether it decides that you're cold uh, or decides that your blood pressure is wrong. Uh, and then the body, and excuse me, then the brain can send out signals to efferent signals to effectors like blood vessels or sweat glands or skeletal muscle uh, or even just other brain regions and uh, change your behavior. So the brain's always sending out efferent signals uh, to effectors. If we look at afferent signals, we can see a list of things we get, and most of these sensations you might be aware of, but many you're not, like your blood pressure or oxygen level or pH. In terms of effectors, the list is pretty simple. It's muscle tissue, including skeletal muscle, heart muscle, and the bladder. Uh, the one, only voluntary control is over skeletal muscle. The, brain, the effectors are also glands. Glands would include the sweat glands and the skin to the uh, endocrine glands inside our body that makes hormones. Also, fat cells are actually an effector, so don't always forget about them. If we organize the nervous system, we divide things up into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is easy. It's the brain and the spinal cord. That's our central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system includes spinal nerves and cranial, cranial nerves. The cranial nerves come directly off our brain, so maybe they go to your eyes or your mouth or your digestive organs straight from the brain, the spinal nerves actually come off the spinal cord and then create complex peripheral nerves uh, that go to our organs. Again, these are to and from, afferent and efferent often. So again, if we use one of our textbook diagrams, we can see our central nervous system, our peripheral nervous system, and of course they communicate, they're hooked up or wired up by these cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. So if your brain decides, hey, I want to walk around, I want to use my muscles, the brain would send signals through the spinal cord. The spinal cord then would send signals out through the motor division because we're talking about muscles and glands and stuff like that, in this case, skeletal muscle. These are air efferent signals. The efferent signals would then go through what's uh, sort of called or... Um, called by scientists the somatic motor division. And really the only thing we're talking about when we talk about somatic motor uh, signals would be voluntary skeletal muscle. So again, in that example, we went uh, through our central nervous system, and peripheral nervous system in order to cause efferent signals for using skeletal muscle. Compare that to if you wanted to contract your stomach to mix your food up or push it into your intestines, you would send signals out from the brain, in this case usually through cranial nerves, through the peripheral nervous system. Again, it's a motor signal since it's efferent going to an effector, but instead we would now use our autonomic nervous system, it's our visceral motor or autonomic nervous system, in order to regulate something like a smooth muscle that's 
involuntary, so things like your organs. And then we'll learn later uh, next week or in a couple weeks about the divisions of the autonomic nervous system. But that's how you would control your stomach. Let's look, about, uh, look at the sensory division of our nervous system. If you were to stick your finger on something sharp, you would create afferent signals. Again, we would say that sensory division, through the sensory division, we would send those signals up to our spinal cord or to our brain, and you would notice that. You would be aware of that. And we call this the somatic sensory division. Somatic refers to things that you're aware of in your body, usually like your skin, for example. Uh, so somatic refers to parts of the body that we notice and that we're aware of all the time. So mainly like our skin and our joints. If you ever have an achy sensation in your stomach, uh, but you're not really sure where that's coming from, it's just a general location, we call those senses visceral sensory uh, information. So visceral sensory information again goes through our sensory division back up to our spinal cord and our brain and, and you might feel it uh, but that visceral stuff you don't get all the time. You don't get that information uh, all the time. If your brain wanted to make your stomach barf because of that pain that would be through the motor division again through the autonomic. So uh, again, think about the motor side of things. Is your brain controlling stuff? Some of the motor signals go to voluntary stuff, some to involuntary stuff. If we look at the sensory side of things, we've got uh, information from our organs that we're not really aware of. We're not really sure where it's hurting. That's visceral versus somatic sensory, very precise, things we're aware of, usually our skin and things like that. We can also divide up sensory with afferent and motor with efferent. Okay, the next learning objective is to describe the type of cells found in the nervous system and review their function. So again, we always talk about cells when we talk about the organ systems, and so the brain is no different. If we look at the brain, the most famous cells might be the neurons, but there's plenty of support cells as well. And if we watch this video here, at least part of it, uh, we can actually see that the brain is packed with cells, uh, not only neurons, but also support cells. These long extensions will learn our axons of our neurons. What they've done here in this video is stained actually the cytoskeleton and the, the sort of tubulin and actin and different proteins inside your cells of your brain. And, and this is actually, I think, a rodent brain. You can see some neuron cell bodies in there. You can see these long extensions, the sort of wires or axons. And then there's all these support cells packed in inside the brain as well. So the brain is full of cells. The ner peripheral nerves in our body are full of cells. The most famous cell is the neuron, and the neuron comes in a lot of different varieties. We'll look at a couple examples of the more common types. So a neuron, like any cell, has a cell body. You know it, you're looking at the cell body because it has a little nucleus, the DNA instruction book. Neurons often have these very long extensions that can go several inches, maybe feet even. Uh, we call that extension an axon. We call the end of the axon the axon terminal. That has stored up neurotransmitter that neurons can use to communicate with other cells, either other neurons or a skeletal muscle myocyte, cardiac muscle myocyte. Sticking off our neurons are input sort of areas or uh, input devices called dendrites. They're really just extensions of the cell body uh, in this example. And so we'll have input from other neurons, for example, into these dendrites. Axon hillock is really just the start of the axon. It's really interesting because that's where the action potential starts. That's where those voltage-gated sodium channels are located uh, to start the action potential. One thing to notice when we draw neurons is sometimes the axons are insulated with a substance, a protein lipid substance called myelin. And myelin will help uh, insulate the axon and help the action potential spread fast. So I wanted to draw a sensory neuron because sensory neurons are a little different. There's those little dendrites, the extensions of the cell. And then we have this big giant long axon just like we expect and those axons can be pretty long. Uh, but the cell body of these sensory neurons are kind of stuck off the uh, side of the axon and the cell body is really far away from those dendrites and I like to think of it as maybe being protective. So for example, sensory neurons in your skin or your organs uh, that can detect 
detect temperature, touch, or pain are far away from the dendrites uh, and are actually near or closer to the spinal cord, excuse me, the cell body is near the spinal cord or the brain. So again, the way I like to think of it is if you ever injure that, that neuron, you will injure part of it that's far away from the body, so maybe that neuron can regenerate. So that's an example of a sensory neuron. Some of our sensory neurons are myelinated, while others are non-myelinated. So again, we're talking about myelination is on that axon, and it changes how fast the action potential is transported and conducted down the length of that axon. So you may notice this sometimes when you stub your toe. When you stub your toe, you actually might feel the, the actual fact that you touched your toe uh, before you feel the pain in your brain. Uh, and so it's sort of like you know that's going to hurt soon uh, because the different signals reach your brain at different speeds. We have lots of helper cells in our uh, nervous tissue, not only in our brain but our peripheral nerves. These helper cells are called glial cells. One of the most famous helper cells is the astrocyte. Astrocytes only found in the brain and the spinal cord. Another type of cell is called an ependymal cell. Those are found in your brain and they help make cerebrospinal fluid which cushions your brain and your spinal cord. Oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells are these very important cell helper cells because they wrap the axon with a substance called myelin. So little oligodendrocytes and uh, oligodendrocytes reach out to axons in your brain and your spinal cord wrapping them with myelin. In peripheral uh, axons, so peripheral nerves, outside the brain and outside the spinal cord, we actually have these little cells called Schwann cells, and Schwann cells like to hug, each one likes to hug part of the axon, and it wraps around it, uh, layering that myelin and layering its cell membrane around the axon, and it, again, insulates the axon just like the oligodendrocyte. So they both have the same effect, oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. Only oligodendrocytes are found only in the central nervous system. And again, we'll talk more about myelin soon. So sometimes these support cells can actually cause cancers like we learned about glioblastoma would be an astrocyte uh, derived cancer. So astrocytes are maybe one of the more famous helper cells. Not only do they help neurons in their function, but they also help create the blood-brain barrier with the endothelial cells that help make up your blood vessels. So when you look at these, uh, these blood vessels in the brain, you'll often see astrocytes rub, uh, hugging around the endothelium, which decreases how much stuff can get into your brain uh, through the blood vessels. The ependymal cells are located in these sort of hollow areas inside our brain that, that are filled with fluid, and so the ependymal cells pump out cerebrospinal fluid all day long. That cerebrospinal fluid then fills these spaces, drains around the brain, and actually helps cushion it. So the brain's pretty delicate. We'll watch a video, and it would kind of squish itself uh, with its own weight if we didn't have that uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Here, I think we already saw this in class, but you can see what's called an astrocytoma or glioblastoma growing in the brain, and that's a cancer uh, from those little astrocytes. Just a quick mention of myelin. Myelin is a substance, again, made by those cells we showed. It's made of several different proteins and lipid, and the good thing about myelin is it actually wraps the axon and improves the ability to have quick action potentials. Loss of myelin can actually lead to uh, disruption of neuron function so that you would have problems uh, sending action potentials. Probably one of the most famous diseases of myelin and loss of myelin is called multiple sclerosis, which affects uh, both males and females, but more females uh, in ages 20 to 40. It's thought that immune cells in our body actually attack our own myelin, destroying the myelin and reducing the ability of our uh, neurons in our central nervous system to work. So you might have symptoms of numbness or vision loss or trouble walking. Uh, and things like that could be signs of this central nervous system disease called multiple sclerosis. The next learning objective is to explain the function of neurons, including membrane voltage, action potentials, and neurotransmitters. So again, we know all about electrical impulses and skeletal muscle,
and we know how that works so it's pretty much the same in neurons the way uh, we have potassium leaving the cell, sodium entering the cell, changes the membrane voltage. We also learned about acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter that triggers action potentials in muscle. So it's gonna, everything's gonna be very similar in our neurons. So again, we have uh, a lot of potassium in our cells, including our neurons. Some of that potassium, just a little bit, leaves through potassium channels and we get a slightly negative charge inside our neurons at rest. Remember, we call that membrane potential or membrane voltage. If you wanted to activate a neuron, just like skeletal muscle, you might throw in some acetylcholine receptors. And if you release acetylcholine and from another neuron and that binds to those little acetylcholine receptors, they would open up, allowing sodium to rush into our cell. And again, sodium's positive, so the inside of our cell then starts to become positive locally, in this case, the cell body. If it becomes positive enough, it can trigger voltage-gated sodium channels, which are located in our little neuron axons. And so if we trigger a few of those voltage-gated sodium channels to open, we will have an action potential. Sodium will rush in. When sodium rushes in, it opens the next set of voltage-gated channels. And down the cell length we go, just like dominoes, uh, each of those little voltage-gated channels opens up, and the action potential sweeps across our axon, uh, and those are electrical impulses. What triggered it, or what started it, in this case, was a chemical message, acetylcholine, which we would call a neurotransmitter. That caused our inside of our cell to become positive in a wave, which we call an action potential. And as we learned with skeletal muscle, if you want to get your neuron back to rest, back to negative, you just simply let some more of that potassium leave the cell through those open channels. It diffuses right out of the cell and the cell goes back to negative. So we're no longer positive. So now we're back to negative and back to rest inside our little neuron. And those voltage-gated sodium channels close, and again, that ends our action potential. So it's all about potassium leaving at rest, and that makes the inside of our muscle cell or our neuron negative. On the inside, just a bit of potassium leaves. And then when you have an action potential, a bunch of sodium rushes in. Again, not all the sodium, but just a little bit diffuses into our cells, enough to make it positive, enough to send a signal very, very long distances that action potential travels far and fast. So let's look a little more at an action potential in a typical neuron. So at rest, we're negative, and we can call that membrane potential, or I like to call it membrane voltage. So again, we're negative at rest because potassium left our cell. And now some chemical signal comes along uh, and triggers an action potential. Again, the inside of our cell becomes positive. As the inside of the cell becomes positive, it triggers all those voltage-gated sodium channels to open up. Sodium rushes into our cell. That shifts us towards positive as sodium rushes in. As more and more sodium rushes in, we reach a peak in our action potential, and now the voltage-gated sodium channels close. They actually inactivate. The little protein slaps shut. But now we're positive on the inside of our cell, so if you look at your little voltmeter, you're positive. But now we're going to come back to negative. We want to go back to rest. So those voltage-gated sodium channels close, but potassium is able to leave through potassium channels, and that eventually makes our cell go back down to negative. And our cell, inside our cell, may even become more negative than we expect because potassium leaving. Uh, but eventually we reach our resting values, and so that's an action potential. Sodium rushing in, potassium rushing out, sets our membrane voltage, either positive or negative. Some vocabulary for us to talk about action potentials. Uh, so vocabulary scientists like it. So if we're at resting potential or resting voltage, we're negative. But if we shift more towards zero or even shift towards positive, we call that depolarization. So any shift towards positive, we call depolarization. It might become positive, you just might become more uh, less negative. Either of that is called depolarization. Whenever our membrane voltage returns back towards negative, we call it repolarization. So going back to negative is repolarization. If it ever goes more negative than rest, which our little uh, 
neuron did during our action potential, we can call it hyperpolarization. So even more negative than normal. So when we look, the depolarization of our action potential is shown there, as well as repolarization, a tiny bit of hyperpolarization, and then back to rest. It's all sodium in the depolarization, and it's all potassium at rest and repolarization. Again, what ends our action potential? The action potential ends because the voltage-gated sodium channels actually close off and inactivate, and also potassium leaves the cell, which stop the positive coming in, let some potassium leave, and you go back to resting value. Again, we call that repolarization. So a key concept or key concepts for our action potentials uh, is to remember that the inside of our cell is negative at rest. And when a neuron's not having an action potential, it's turned off, right? We might call that inhibited. Now, if you want to activate your little neuron, you want it to have an action potential, you basically have to open those voltage-gated sodium channels. And the voltage-gated sodium channels are found in the axon hillock and the axon. So the way we can trigger an action potential is usually using a chemical signal, or sometimes we'll use things like touch or temperature or pain. But the thing they all have in common is that sodium, or even sometimes calcium, will rush in, make the inside of our cell positive enough to trigger those voltage-gated sodium channels. And then once you trigger some of those voltage-gated sodium channels, the action potential spreads like a wave in your axon. So again, acetylcholine is an example. Acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors, which can trigger an action potential. We learn that both in skeletal muscle, but also now in neurons. What about if you wanted to inhibit a neuron, so turn it off and keep it off and not allow it to have an action potential? Well, a different chemical, an example is glycine. Glycine binds to glycine receptors, and that causes chloride to rush into your cell. When chloride rushes into your neuron, it makes it more negative. If it's more negative, those little voltage-gated sodium channels can't open. They stay closed, so you can't get an action potential. So that's how your body is able to either activate your neurons or turn them off. If we talk about uh, sensory neurons, they're interesting in that, for example, pain or touch or temperature can actually activate protein receptors. And those protein receptors then, uh, again, in the case of activating a neuron, you want things like sodium and calcium to rush in. So in this example, a pain chemical caused uh, these channels to open up so sodium and calcium rushes in. If enough of that rushes in, the inside of the cell becomes positive and we can then trigger those voltage-gated sodium channels to open up one by one, sending an action potential back towards my brain and my spinal cord uh, so that you actually sense uh, pain and interpret that as pain. Now if we want to uh, block the pain signals, we can use a chemical that blocks the voltage-gated sodium channels so that even though you're, you're experiencing pain in your face during your root canal, uh, those pain signals never reach your spinal cord or your brain because the voltage-gated sodium channels won't open up because of the drug, so you can't send the action potential all the way back to your brain. So we call that a nerve block. So again, a lot of these uh, things like epidurals or uh, nerve blocks will actually target the voltage-gated sodium channels in the axons of your neurons and nerves so that the action potential stops along those axons. Things like lidocaine and xylocaine, if you've heard of those local anesthetic injections, uh, basically do that. They block the voltage-gated sodium channels. And those can block no, not only the afferent sensory signals and numb you, but they can also block the motor neurons and and actually cause your face to be paralyzed and maybe you can't smile or close your mouth. So again, a nerve block is really just blocking uh, part of that action potential transmission along the length of the axon so the signals don't reach your brain. And if you've ever used ice to numb uh, or you know numb a joint or something, it uses a very similar, a similar mechanism in that uh, cold can in inactivate those voltage-gated sodium channels.
If you're wondering where are those voltage-gated sodium channels in the axon when we have myelin, they actually are found at clusters between the, the myelin wrapping. And so you actually only have to put ion channels uh, at the nodes between the myelin versus an unmyelinated axon or non-myelinated axon. You have to stick those voltage-gated sodium channels all along the axon and it makes the transmission of the action potential slower in those uh, non-myelinated neurons. And so if you're wondering why do we have some myelinated and unmyelinated, probably it's just evolution of the different types of neurons in our nervous system. Okay, if we look at a group of neurons, I probably didn't mention the communication between a neuron and another cell is called a synapse. And again, we're seeing that our neurons like to use chemicals or neurotransmitters to signal to each other. And so some chemicals excite the neurons and other chemicals inhibit the neurons. Again, inhibit, think of turning them off. Exciting, think of turning them on so that they have an action potential. So an inhibitory neurotransmitter shuts down your neurons. An excitatory neurotransmitter turns on your neurons. So let's look at three neurons signaling to each other. Neuron number one has an action potential releases acetylcholine, which causes an action potential in neuron 3. So that would be an excitatory neurotransmitter in this case. Neuron number 2 releases a chemical called glycine. That causes chloride to move into the same cell, neuron 3, and that shuts it down because it's negative, and so there is no action potential. So we would call that an inhibitory signal, or say that glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Again, neuron 2 has an action potential and then releases glycine, which then turns off neuron number 3. And so we can actually see now we can get pretty complex. If uh, there are multiple inputs to every single neuron, you could see that some of them are exciting and some of them are inhibiting the same neuron. And it's really just uh, sort of a, an additive effect of which is more, which one wins out, excitatory signals or inhibitory signals. Some of the more famous neurotransmitters, acetylcholine obviously we've already learned about, but you've probably heard of things like dopamine and epinephrine. Uh, some will talk about GABA and glycine, glutamate, serotonin. All of these are brain chemicals, uh, spinal cord chemicals, nervous chemicals uh, that signal in our nervous system. So remember, the inside of our cell is negative because some potassium left. And so now we're going to decide if things are excitatory or inhibitory. You really just need to know whether it makes the inside of the cell more positive. So in the case of acetylcholine, sodium rushes in, so that's excitatory. In the case of serotonin, actually often more potassium will leave when that signals to your neuron. If potassium leaves, the inside becomes more negative. So serotonin is traditionally thought of as an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it really just depends on whether sodium rushes in, calcium rushes in. Uh, sodium and calcium rushing in are positive, so that's excitatory. Potassium leaving is inhibitory. Chloride entering into your cells is inhibitory. And so if we just go through for each of these more famous ones, dopamine typically binds to a receptor. And then those receptors activate channels for sodium and calcium, so dopamine is excitatory. GABA and glycine activate channels that allow chloride in, so GABA and glycine are inhibitory neurotransmitters. Glutamate tends to activate channels for sodium and calcium to rush in, as well as acetylcholine, so those are considered excitatory. Serotonin kind of has both effects, but it's more famous for causing potassium to leave the cell and become more negative, so serotonin will consider inhibitory. All of these neurotransmitters bind to receptors and have their function. And so again, we've learned about receptors are just proteins in the membrane. A lot of these neurotransmitters are famous for a lot of the things that you might enjoy. So for example, if you really like uh, your favorite song, that will activate dopamine signaling in your brain. Or maybe you take a prescription drug which targets some of these receptors for these various neurotransmitters to make your brain feel better. Uh, if you take recreational drugs and feel really good, that might be activating these brain chemicals, again, these neurotransmitters.
And if you've ever heard the term crazy in love, that might be true or closer to true than you think. When you're in love, they've studied the brain chemical changes and increases in dopamine or epinephrine, oxytocin, decreased serotonin. All of these cause these very, very strong changes in brain behavior. So the term crazy in love might be more true uh, than you think. The brain is all about neurons and neurons signal it, signaling to each other. And neuron signaling is all about neurotransmitters and their activity levels. So there's ever an imbalance in the brain chemicals or the activity of these neurons. Or if the neurons are damaged, you can see how that will affect your brain's function. And if you've ever taken a drug or heard of drugs that affect the brain, some famous ones like Valium target the GABA pathway so that more chloride moves into your cells and shuts down brain areas maybe for anxiety. Uh, alcohol has a very similar effect in uh, sort of stimulating these inhibitory pathways. Uh, Paxil, Lexapro, Zoloft, they all target the serotonin pathways and it's sort of interesting. They target the reuptake of serotonin after it's been released in the synapse. So when you take these drugs, it increases the serotonin levels in your brain, which then makes you hopefully feel better. Uh, drugs like Adderall or amphetamines uh, or stimulates that stimulants that block the reuptake of neurotransmitters such as epinephrine and dopamine. So anyway, a lot of these drugs that you've probably heard of uh, or will hear of uh, usually will target these different brain pathways and chemicals, excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. Uh, just quickly, I wanted to make a note that most brain disorders and diseases will either have to do with damage to neurons in a region or sometimes just the activity of these neurons. So in cases of, say, OCD or addiction, it may just have to do with neural activity versus something like Alzheimer's or a stroke where you've damaged brain cells, neurons. If you're obsessed with listening to your favorite song, that uh, might be triggered by these reward pathways inside your brain that release lots and lots of dopamine, and that makes your brain really, really stimulated and happy. So things like cigarettes as well. Nicotine in cigarettes actually binds to an acetylcholine receptor. The acetylcholine receptor then uh, activates pathways. One of the pathways is the reward pathway for dopamine. And so again, these drugs and cigarettes and music can have very powerful effects on your brain. Okay, we're going to describe the basic structure and organization of the brain. I really just wanted to focus on the protective layers around the brain. And so the brain has three protective layers underneath the skull. The skull bone, of course, uh, we learn the bones. There's periosteum on that skull bone. But then there's three protective layers that surround the brain of connective tissue, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. And cerebrospinal fluid is sandwiched in between the connective layer, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. And so that CSF helps cushion our brain. Also, these connective tissue layers have lots of blood vessels. If you look at an actual brain surgery, you can see the dura mater, the arachnoid mater. You can kind of tell that there's some CSF cushioning inside that brain there. And I wanted to show this video. This is a, a fresh, unfixed human brain, and it's kind of sped up there. But you can see the brain is really soft, so the brain actually needs CSF to float it within that skull, within the, the bone, so it doesn't squish on itself through its own weight. So the cerebrospinal fluid actually, in essence, helps keep the brain nice and cushioned and decreases its effective weight so it doesn't smush on itself. All right, the meninges are the protective, uh, protective tissue layers around the brain, the meninges. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention are these ventricles. The ventricles are these hollow filled, CSF filled, they're not hollow, but they're fluid filled spaces inside the brain. Uh, these structures called choroid plexuses have ependymal cells which make CSF. The CSF then drains around the brain in the subarachnoid space between the arachnoid and pia mater, and that CSF then cushions the brain. That same CSF travels all around the spinal cord as well, cushioning the spinal cord, so that CSF of the spinal cord mixes with the CSF of the brain. Again, the CSF is made in these ventricles by these blood vessel structures with ependymal cells, 
call the choroid plexus. So the choroid plexus basically turns blood and filters it into CSF. If you look, you can find those ventricles, those CSF filled spaces in a brain using an MRI. And you can see some, they're not huge, the ventricles, but they're tiny little uh, CSF filled pockets inside the brain. Um, you can see the cerebrum really well, and so we're going to talk more about the brain. Uh, most of the brain regions are hidden by this big giant cerebrum, uh, and we can cut it open. We can see our inside our brain. Uh, if we do a coronal cut there, you can see these darker regions and these lighter regions, sometimes called white matter and gray matter. Uh, the white matter is mostly axons and the myelin, causing it to be white. Uh, the cell bodies look darker. And so we can actually see these uh, in gross anatomy, uh, even without a microscope, these dark and gray regions and white regions. Okay, the final learning objective here is to take a tour of the brain and learn a little bit about the different brain areas and their functions. So again, if we look at a brain, there's sur superficial regions, there's deep regions, there's gray matter, there's white matter. Uh, a lot of the parts of the brain are sort of deep inside, hidden from the outside viewing, so we have to cut open the brain to see some of those. These are the brain regions. Of course, the spinal cord connects to the medulla oblongata, and then we have our brain stem, which we'll talk more about. And then as we move our way up, we have the thalamus and hypothalamus, which are called the diencephalon. We have our little baby brain back there, the cerebellum. And then the easy to see and very famous cerebrum, which is probably most of what you think about uh, when you think about your brain. So we'll go through each of these regions and a little bit about their function. Uh, let's start with the brain stem. You can see those highlighted here on the bottom, again, connected to our spinal cord. Uh, the brain stem includes the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. And so that is your brain stem. And again, they're deep, most of it's covered. Stuck on the back there is our little cerebellum. The cerebellum we'll talk about has to do with motor commands and coordination. If we stack on up on top of our midbrain is our thalamus. You see the thalamus are those two little cylinder or uh, two oval structures there. Underneath the thalamus is the hypothalamus. Sort of, uh, sort of circling around in there and connecting our left and right brain or cerebrum is the corpus callosum, so that's really easy to see. And then you can see all our brain regions sort of stuck on there. The outside here we're seeing is the cerebrum, and the cerebrum we can divide up into lobes, frontal, temporal, occipital, parietal lobes. And so that's a quick tour of brain anatomy. Uh, there's deep regions in the cerebrum. These deep regions include things like the hippocampus, which is part of your sort of like your temporal lobe. Uh, there's other deep regions like the amygdala. So again, these are kind of hard to visualize, but they're deep in the cerebrum hanging out there, uh, kind of hidden away unless you cut open the brain really well. Basal ganglia as well. Those are pretty famous for uh, movement disorders like Parkinson's. So we're going to do a sagittal cut here so that we can see interior to the brain. And we'll start there at our foramen magnum. And the first part of our brain is the medulla oblongata, then the pons, and then finally the midbrain if we want to build our brain stem. So again, we just kind of stack them on top of each other. On top of the brain stem, there's the brain stem. Uh, sticking out there, I wanted to mention the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is not part of the brain, but it is stuck onto the brain. And next, we're going to show our thalamus and our hypothalamus. Part of the hypothalamus extends down to the pituitary. We even have something called the epithalamus or pineal gland. The epithalamus and pineal gland we'll talk about makes a hormone. The corpus callosum is this group of axons that connect your right and left cerebrum. And the cerebrum is probably the most famous part. The outer part of the cerebrum is the cerebral cortex. And then don't forget your cerebellum stuck on the back there, kind of by the pons. So that's brain anatomy. We'll go over more of that in lab. So for each of the brain regions, I wanted to think about one or two famous functions that we could hopefully remember, at least for our test, if not for longer. So let's start with the medulla. 
The medulla I consider life support. It helps monitor things like your blood pressure. So little neurons in the medulla actually all day long keep track of your blood pressure. Also keep track of your respiratory rate. So they actually are setting the respiratory rhythm. Your brain needs to send signals to your diaphragm and that's done in the medulla. It also regulates your heart rate, just speeding it up or slowing it down. And it sends all these signals up and down from the brain to our spinal cord. So I wanted to mention that a lot of the crossover of our axons occurs in our medulla oblongata. So like your left brain controls your right muscles and vice versa. The pons is probably most famous for connecting to our cerebellum, which isn't that interesting, but it also does something and it regulates your breathing pattern. It doesn't set the breathing rate, that's done by the medulla, but it does set the pattern. And then a really cool thing I thought I read was that the pons actually stop signals from moving out of your brain down to your spinal cord while you're sleeping so that you don't act out your dreams. Next is the midbrain. The midbrain has, the, has these important brain regions that keep you awake and conscious. Uh, it also has brain regions that are important in auditory and visual reflexes, so uh, pupillary uh, Pupillary reflex would involve that midbrain, uh, basically shining a light and causing your pupil to constrict. The cerebellum is involved in motor activity. So when you decide, when your brain, your cerebrum decides, I want to throw a ball, not only does it send signals to your skeletal muscle, but it also sends signals to your cerebellum. Your muscle also sends afferent signals to your cerebellum, telling uh, your cerebellum what your muscle is doing and the cerebellum compares what you intended to do and what you're actually doing and hopefully corrects that. So it's important in uh, skeletal muscle coordination and skeletal muscle motor activity uh, and things like balance. So it basically compares efferent and afferent information going to your muscles and from your muscles and decides, am I doing what my brain really wants to do? Uh, and so it's pretty cool. That's how your cerebellum works. Next we have the thalamus, so the thalamus is located real centrally in there. Uh, it's famous for being the relay station for pretty much all the senses. All the senses, say pain from your fingertips or your tongue, are routed through that thalamus before they can reach your cerebrum and your consciousness. So the thalamus again is for a relay station for all of our senses, not including smell, uh, but all the other ones, vision, uh, taste, touch temperature, all that stuff routes through your thalamus before it reaches your conscious awareness. So that's, it does other things, but that's, that's what we're going to remember it for. The hypothalamus is below the thalamus, and it's very, very small, but it's amazing how many things it's involved in. One is it, it's a link between your brain and your pituitary gland, and so the hypothalamus is the link between the nervous system and the endocrine system, which we'll learn much more about. The hypothalamus also has neurons that regulate your body temperature, so it's the controller for body temperature. It's specific in the hypothalamus. Parts of the hypothalamus are involved in hunger and thirst. It's also part of your limbic system, which we'll talk more about. It has to do with emotions. Uh, the hypothalamus makes uh, hormones that signal to the pituitary gland, so it's a pretty important area. I just wanted to mention quickly the pineal gland, or epithalamus, uh, makes a somewhat famous hormone called melatonin. Melatonin basically induces sleep and makes you sleepy. So say at night at 12 a.m. you get a spike in melatonin from this pineal gland. It'll make you sleepy. For the rest of the time we're going to focus on the cerebrum. And so probably the most famous part of the cerebrum is the cerebral cortex. That's the outer part. Um, but there's also deep cerebral regions which are very important, which are buried underneath there. One of the more famous parts of the deep cerebrum are the basal ganglia. Your textbook might call them the basal nuclei. Uh, they're very important in, uh, their function is very important in movement, sort of like background muscle movements. And so 
probably know a lot about these because of diseases like Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease where you have shaking and tremors because some area of the basal ganglia either is destroyed or damaged or maybe not working well. The basal ganglia also have those dopamine reward centers that get fired up um, and are involved in some diseases like ADHD. The next area of the deep cerebrum is called the hippocampus. Hippocampus is really well known for memory. And so again, we learn a lot from diseases. So Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease is loss and damage to these neurons in the hippocampus, which causes memory loss. It's also part of the limbic system, which we'll come back to. Uh, so again, if you're forgetting things, maybe something's wrong with the hippocampus. The amygdala is nearby. The amygdala is involved in fear, emotion, emotional memories. It's also part of your limbic system and probably has some role in uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's the amygdala, fear, emotion, danger, risk-taking. So I keep mentioning this limbic system. The limbic system is not an anatomical spot, but rather several brain regions, the amygdala, hippocampus, hypothalamus, uh, and even parts of the cerebrum that are involved in your emotional states. Things like aggression, anger, fear, your uh, emotional memory are all part of this limbic system. Even smell is tied into it. Uh, and so this is interesting because of uh, people have been studying PTSD more and more and finding out lots about the limbic system. Uh, there's a genetically engineered mouse that I thought was really interesting and that I read about. So they genetically changed the DNA. So this mouse, uh, I believe it didn't make or made more of a protein just in its amygdala and they became fearless mice. And so just by changing a protein in the amygdala, you could make these mice that were born fearless, but they also wouldn't learn to fear things. So even if you did bad things to the little mouse, it didn't care to avoid it. Uh, the next time it would do the same exact thing. So clearly the amygdala has uh, a role in, in risk-taking and fear and learned fear. Uh, so maybe if you're fearless, you might have a different amygdala than some of us who are more fearful. All right, the cerebral cortex, it's this outer edge, the sort of outer core, outer shell of our cerebrum, the cerebral cortex. And it's all wrinkled up like that. All those wrinkles help increase the surface area, and you can pack more neurons in there uh, and make your brain process even more like a better computer. Again, that cerebral cortex is really just the outer edge of the cerebrum, and so you could see it here. It's darker. So that means that it has lots and lots of cell bodies, and then the white matter underneath it in the cerebrum is lots and lots of axons. So again, most of what you're conscious and aware of in your brain is taking place in the cerebral cortex. We can divide the cerebral cortex into anatomical lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, etc. But we could also divide the cerebral cortex into functional areas. So your occipital lobe, for example, has your visual cortex or your frontal lobe has your prefrontal cortex, which is involved in things like your um, sort of motivation and your higher thinking and dreams and hopes and things like that. The parietal lobe has something called your sensory cortex. The sensory cortex is in charge of processing sensory information. So we can talk about anatomical regions or more interesting sometimes is this cortical mapping or functional zones within our cerebral cortex. Many of these are discovered using functional MRI where you can actually map blood flow changes. So you can ask somebody to do something or think about something and then follow the blood flow changes in the cerebrum using MRI. And you can actually find a specific place in your cerebrum that determines the trustworthiness of faces and they've actually determined where that is in the brain. So let's go through some of these cortexes or functional regions. One is the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is involved in your most complex thoughts, your reasoning, your judgment, your deciding whether to study right now or watch TV, uh, your cognition, your, your conscience, things like that. Uh, and interestingly, in teenagers, that prefrontal cortex cortex is still developing, it's still remodeling, and so that might explain a little bit why teenagers uh, sort of act the way they do, right? They have 
different judgment and risk-taking behavior, uh, as well as their personality seems to change. Our motor cortex is located sort of in that bridge between the frontal parietal zone. The motor commands when you use your skeletal muscle originate in that motor cortex and go down to your skeletal muscles for voluntary commands and voluntary control of your muscle. One thing to take note of is that the motor cortex controls the opposite side of the body. So your left motor cortex will tend to control the muscles in the right side of your body. And we could actually map out our motor cortex, and they've done that on each side of your brain. Again, you have a right and a left motor cortex. You might have more motor cortex dedicated to certain parts of your musculature uh, versus others. Again, your left brain would control your right hand, etc. The premotor cortex is sort of found more anteriorly in the frontal zone. That's for sort of motor planning, thinking about when you're going to use your muscles. So I like to think of imagining shooting a basketball would activate the motor premotor cortex, which would then activate your motor cortex. In a similar region as those two, we actually have a specific area called Broca's area, which is our speech motor area. So the motor commands just for speaking are housed in Broca's area, right there underneath the premotor and motor cortex. This is usually only found in the left side of your brain, and so we'll talk more about that. It's called unilateral. The sensory cortex is located in our parietal lobe. Uh, again, since it's sensory, first those signals go to the thalamus, and then they're routed up to the strip of sensory cortex in your parietal lobe where it reaches your awareness. Most of our sensory information crosses over again so that the right side of our body, the informa sensory information, is processed in our left sensory cortex. And again, they've mapped it where lots of your sensory cortex is dedicated to things like your hands and your face and your lips that are more sensitive and less to your visceral organs or your trunk. The sensory association area is really just the rest of the parietal lobe. The rest of the parietal lobe then has to interpret that sensory information and decide is that a cold soda can or a rough piece of paper or dog fur, and so that's done in the sensory association area, interpretation. And I assume some memories of senses are stored in there as well. So again, just to summarize there, our signals come up to the thalamus, to the sensory cortex, and then are parceled off to the sensory association area to interpret. Our visual cortex and visual awareness is housed in our occipital lobe. The very, very back of our occipital lobe is our visual. Uh, cortex and around it will be association areas where we can actually interpret those visual signals as faces or as language and things like that. So again information comes from our eye, reaches our visual cortex and then has to go to other parts of the brain probably in order to interpret it. Our auditory cortex is in our temporal lobe uh, our temporal lobe has those those uh, neuron regions f to interpret uh, most of your sounds and auditory things. Uh, Wernicke's area is a very famous sensory language area. So I like to think of it as language interpretation, whether it's spoken language or read language, uh, written language, that language is um, interpreted or comprehended in Wernicke's area. And again, like Broca's, we tend to find this only on the left side of our brain for most people. And so Broca's is the motor speech area, Wernicke's is the language comprehension area, and they're actually interconnected. Okay, so when we look at the left cerebrum and the right cerebrum, they're actually only connected to each other through a couple parts and in a couple places. And probably one of the most famous areas connecting the right and left cerebrum is this bundle of axons called the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is one of the primary ways that the left cerebrum can communicate with the right cerebrum. And so whenever the left brain and the right brain are doing things, they actually have to send signals back and forth to each other to let them know what's going on. So if your left cerebrum is controlling the right side of your body, your muscles, and the right cerebrum is calling controlling the left side of your muscles, in order for them to know what each other's doing, they send signals back and forth through the corpus callosum.
If you were to cut the corpus callosum, then you would effectively have your left cerebrum working independently from your right cerebrum. So that corpus callosum you can see here, you can actually see it really well on an MRI. The corpus callosum there is very bright because it's a lot of axons. Sometimes it doesn't develop correctly, which can impair brain function. These scientists actually map the interconnections between the brain, and you can see that corpus callosum is the only, or primary connection, it's not the only connection right to left. If you've ever heard of the term right brain or left brain person, uh, I don't know if that's completely correct, but certainly the left hemisphere versus the right hemisphere of our cerebrum seem to be um, better at doing certain tasks. Other tasks are housed in both uh, sides of the brain, uh, but certainly things like speech and, and, and language seem to be housed more on the left side of most people's brain. Again, when something is on one side, we call it lateralized, or we say lateral dominance, and speech and language would be an example of something that's lateralized. And that ends our tour of the brain. I will see you guys in class. We can clear up or talk more about our brain. We'll watch some videos and see you guys in class.